Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I am joined once again today by Jonathan Ferguson, who is the Keeper of Firearms and Artillery at the British Royal Armories, and the author of uh, our, our head stamp book, uh, Thornycroft to SA-80 British Bullpup Rifles, which is currently available for pre-sale on Kickstarter. So we thought it'd be really cool to talk to you about some of the other elements in this book. Um, some of the, the cool stories that, that your work, your research, and your writing has led you to that people don't really know that much about. Mm -hmm. And so focusing specifically on the EM2 here, I was thinking about the fact, like the NATO trials in the 50s. Um, a lot of people, especially in the US, primarily think about those in terms of the M14 and the FAL, and the battle back and forth. But there was a third co-equal player in those trials, which was the EM2. And it's way cooler looking than any of the other two. So I don't know why they didn't adopt it. I figured maybe you can help us with some context of you know, what was going on. What happened to this rifle in the trials? Sure, I can certainly try. Um, I should say that there are other people who have done the original research on this that, that I'm referencing and do reference in the book. Mm -hmm. um, there are uh, like a hardcore of handful of people that, that have really <laughs> delved into this. And people will be familiar with um, Thomas Doobleby's book, mm -hmm. if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. I've only ever read it, I've never said it. Not quite true. I think you've got that. Right? <laughs> uh, which is great, but um, some things have moved on. There are some errors in there. Um, so the one of the biggest chapters in the book, unsurprisingly, is about this thing. Um, and the pivot point of the whole thing, as you say, the 1950 Aberdeen Proving Ground Trials of the 280 cartridge, 7mm cartridge, and the weapon. Now, I'm thinking, I'm talking about the trials of the weapon. As you rightly say, most people, especially in the States, are thinking about what becomes the M14 versus um, what becomes the FN Val. Um, like this thing is sort of trailing in behind. And actually, they're, they're on more than equal ground. The, 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 what becomes the Val is not doing well okay. in the 1950 tri uh, trials. Accuracy is a, is a big problem uh, for, for both, actually, for both rifles in 280. Incidentally, we should say that um, the 280 mm cartridge, 49mm, uh, um, uh, sorry, 43mm case length, okay. um, is an intermediate uh, quote unquote cartridge, but it's on the high end, isn't it? Yeah, because it's not intermediate like 5.56 or the, set, the Russian 7.62 by 39. It's, it's like rifle cartridge light. Yeah. So Britain is, as all of the other countries after the Second World War, are taking slightly different lessons away. So the, the state sticks very much on the long range marksmanship, full power cartridge track, wants to create a lightened version of that with an automatic capability for essentially emergency use only. That's the, that's the US idea of a light rifle, as I understand it, a lightweight rifle. And so they, you, <laughs> are working on um, a reduced cartridge insofar as it's physically shorter. So right. the action can be shorter, the ammunition and the weapon can be somewhat lighter to fit that, that remit. Right, but the cartridge is basically the same power as 30 yeah. six. Yeah, it's the savage bullet, I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, but it, they're, they're trying to recreate what they have already in a shorter case. Right, yeah. Um, Britain, along with some other countries, are taking more of a lesson from what Germany's doing with the Sturmgewehr um, and wanting a genuinely lighter, lower recoiling cartridge that allows you to use automatic fire, not just in an emergency, potentially bursts from the shoulder, which, which were being used at the time, and in the assault position, like a full-on SMG. Okay. And, and really, that's, that's where we're starting to think is, and we'll see this again with the SA-80 program, but to replace as many weapons as we possibly can, like potentially all of the weapons in the section, potentially, not quite where that goes, but that's the idea. So to do that, you uh, obviously reduce the cartridge length, you reduce the, the action. They then wanted to go a major step further, preserve that barrel length. So they're already anticipating American needs, that, that we need a long range, accurate rifle. What's the best way to, to, to do that? And save weight, the main driver seems to be to reduce weight. What's okay. the easiest way to do that? Take off the buttstock. And you'll see it described as buckless, stockless. We never use bullpup. The term bullpup is never used huh. on the okay. British side. 
Um, there's a, there's a, I actually, there's a sidebar going to uh, where the term bullpup comes from. Okay, kind of nailed that one down. So maybe Let's talk about that time. separately. <laughs> yeah, so we, we end up with two competing philosophies, both relatively lightweight, about eight pounds, um, okay. both capable in theory out to maybe 600 yards, but coming from very different places. Um, and spoiler alert, <laughs> the US is never going to accept a reduced power cartridge of any kind. Right. And it's easy with hindsight to, to say this, but this really should have been obvious. In parallel to all of this is the strong urge, which pops up about 1943, to standardize with the US. Right. Two, the two great powers of, of the Allies. And then later on, that becomes a NATO ambition. It's kind of where they're going with the trials. Okay. So, how, was there any effect, uh, or was there any influence on this of considering the machine gun at the same time as the infantry rifle? Because from what I've read, one of the rationales, and I've seen some of the documentation on the U.S. side of, like, we need there to be, the, in fact, the, the, the uh, graphic that I saw was about the safe zone. It's like, you want to be able to hit out to, like, six or 800 yards, but if you have a lightweight cartridge, it drops more which means you have to aim higher to hit a guy at 800. And if you've misestimated the range and he's only at 600, because of the bullet's trajectory, the bullet will go right over his head. Whereas with the American cartridge, it shoots flatter because it's higher velocity. Yeah. And you have less of the safe zone. You can misestimate the range more worser and still hit. Um, and at the same time, the machine guns <laughs> in the, you know, the standard um, military layout yeah benefit more from a heavier cartridge. You don't have to worry about recoil and you know, second follow-up shot. Yep. Was that, was the British approach to this based primarily on rifle weight, or was it, were they trying to balance, you need to keep the cartridge heavy enough for a machine gun? Hmm, they, see, they seem to give up on that, hmm. essentially. So early on, there's, there's the idea that it could replace everything in the section, in the squad. Um, but there's a realization with the 280 that that's not quite going to work. And it's, they're, not, that's, they're not admitting a, a failing of the cartridge, per se. It's more, it's more the weapon. You, can, you can't give sufficient volume of fire. You know, there's this light automatic gun idea where the, the EM-1 Corsac is going. And in theory, the EM-1 Thorpe and the EM-2 Janssen could have served the light automatic gun role. The, the literature talks about, uh, the archives talk about um, Roles versus weapons. So okay. when they talk about light automatic gun, they could be talking about a rifle serving that role. And we go over this again in the 70s and 80s. Did um, they ever do an experimental, like an L86 version of the EM2? Longer barrel, bipod, heavy barrel? There, well, reflecting the idea that it could serve that role, the first version of the handguard, which doesn't survive, actually has the same bipod attachment boss as the EM1 Thorpe does. Yeah. So the idea was you slap on a bipod and you've got a poor man's machine gun. Not, not too dissimilar from what the M16 was issued with originally with a mm. clip-on bipod, but that gets deleted. You can see them drifting away from the idea that the EM2 is anything but, mm. well, it's a rifle, it's a submachine gun. That's kind of it by this point. Yeah. Uh, but they do experiment with a heavy barrel um, uh, version briefly. Um, but where, where they sort of um, hitch, hitch their proverbial car is a different gun, totally different belt-fed gun for not the section. So, and it, this this constant debate, doesn't know whether you have embedded belt-fed firepower in the, in the squad or whether it comes in from a high level. And that's where they're going. So they're developing um, the Tatum gun um, for either on a sustained fire mount or, you know, like a sort of like the Bren smashed up with a with a MG42. It's got some really crude. Well, well like, like take the Bren and turn it into a universal machine gun. Basically, you've put it better than better than I have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there's parallel development, and again, by focusing on British bullpup military firearms, I'm not able to go into that in any great depth. So you start okay. zero, you get a bit of tunnel vision on not only the infantry small arms but the bullpup infantry small arms. So you have to be careful. But, I mean, they're, they're just, in, they're intrinsically interesting as a concept. They really are. Yeah. And in some ways, the fact that they didn't get adopted makes them even more interesting. It's the road not travel. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, there's, there's a section there about um, exactly that. There's this idea that 
you know, the British Empire is starting to, to break up and come apart. Um, there's not much money there, which is one of the reasons that we, we don't adopt it. And it's this kind of what might have been like the TSR-2 aircraft mm -hmm. or the Avro Arrow for Canada. You know, it's this, oh, look at this amazing piece of engineering. The politicians ruined it. It's, that's the meme. Yeah. Yeah. So I have two more questions. Let's first say, what really did ruin it? Yes, yes, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in, seriously, in, in large, it's definitely political, um, but there are practical considerations as well. And had we had the politics not intervened, and we'd gone with it, we could have set ourselves up with some problems. Uh, we mentioned cost. Um, I think the, the figure they worked out was you'd get five EM2s for six fouls, or the other way around, I should say. Nope. So you get one more rifle every time, which actually, when you're trying to equip 200,000 guys, that well, becomes a you know, few million pounds here and there, soon enough, you've got real money. Yeah, and what's interesting, I think, is that and, and, and the meme will, will skew towards the politics and, and gloss over the fact that there are inherent practical problems with not so much that the design is flawed. Um, in fact, as, as, as we discovered relatively recently, or I have anyway, the reliability figures in, in the Aberdeen trials that we were talking about are really not that bad. This, this thing was fine. It could have been the, the foul progenitor was doing far worse. Hmm. Accuracy, reliability, the lot. And it turned into a solid rifle. Yeah, this would have as well. I can I can okay. state that fairly confidently. Okay. Um, so so in parallel, you've got this constant tension between Britain is trying to forge its own path. Two eighty intermediate cartridge, super compact space age, yeah, <laughs> bullpup rifle with an optic. America's not having that. So how does this? level out at the bottom, what pops out at the end. And as we know, it's, for us, the L1A1 FAL, for America, it's the M14, it's sharing the same cartridge. So the politicians, Winston Churchill's name comes up time and again, achieved that. This, this was a very earnest goal. Right. So when we say politics, it's not just cynical game playing, it's a, it's a genuine desire for these two great nations to have the same kit, ideally the same rifle, the same cartridge didn't quite work out that way. Having the same cartridge is not an insignificant standardization. No, it's That's not. And they certainly, at the time, they really thought it was a huge advantage. They think they just come out of World War II. How do you supply each other in, in almost in battle and certainly at a higher logistical level? It's millions of rounds changing hands. You can't do it. You can't do it unless you have the same cartridge. Um, so, I mean, Churchill, let's, let's, let's deal with the, the elephant in the room there. Yeah. Um, so he had this, this Keen political, but also pra pragmatic desire to standardize, and America was never going to take the cartridge. If they're never going to take the cartridge, and by the way, they're also very skeptical about just the idea of the gun that fires it. What is this thing? Studler in particular is, yeah, comes up. Um, he's not chief, this. chief of Army Ordnance, so I forget his uh, correct job title. He wasn't Chief of Army Ordnance, but he was in charge of a lot of the development of R&D. Yeah. Yeah. High enough, high enough up the chain to cause some real problems. Yeah. And like if Churchill, well, <laughs> Churchill was probably softer on this than he was, put it that way. So <laughs> America was dead set against both, actually. But no reason why, because we standardised on just the cartridge in the event, why we couldn't have kept the 7.62 version of the rifle, which is what's in front of us right right now. Quickly though, with with Churchill, it's not just political, it's not just pragmatic. He really likes the foul. Really? Really likes the fire. Huh. Sadly not in our collection, but in the Imperial War Museum collection, is this beautiful, deep blue finished presentation FAL rifle, gold inscribed to Winston Churchill. Huh. And on the Magwell is a quote from him about how great he thinks the fowl is. Huh. It's hey, just no idea. sums it up. Wow. There'll be a picture in the book. Okay. Um, it's just, if you needed any evidence that he was personally invested in Dumb sinking it is Exactly right. Huh, interesting. Yeah. All right. So my one last question, I wanted to comment on this optic. Yeah. No one puts an optic, this was a standard service rifle. Yeah. No one put an optic on every service rifle until like the 80s. Correct. And yet here's this. Yeah. What, what was, who came, how did such a good idea get in in the first place and then what killed it? 
I'm not saying it was aliens, but <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's forward thinking, but it's not maybe quite as forward thinking as you think. It's a series of um, consequences. One thing building on the next. So you go for a light rifle. That means in British eyes, you remove the butt to save weight. That creates almost inevitably a, an inline design, which has its own advantages, as you know. Mm -hmm. Straight line recoil is good, especially for automatic fire. Um, but that means your eye is now now at the wrong right. height. Okay, so you could just put iron sights on stalks, and that's kind of what they've done for the backup sights that are on this rifle. Carry handle. This is really where the carry handle kind of comes in. It's not. It's a carry handle second, and it's a sight rail first. Okay. I think it's safe to say. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. The bigger problem is by foreshortening the gun, you're foreshortening the sight base of sight radius. So your irons, you can still have your iron sights, but they're inherently less accurate. Right. So a tiny adjustment here translates to a huge adjustment <sighs> downrange. So you need an optic. Okay. So they're forward thinking, but it's not, we are going to equip every Tommy, I'm not really calling them that anymore, but um, with an optical sight because it's the 20th century, damn it. It's not so much that, it's compensating for, it's like a sliding mm -hmm. scale. You pull one slider along, the others go down, you know? It's, Okay. <laughs> it's like, not, not this was our goal in the first place, but this is the best remaining solution we can see to a problem that we've created. Yes, and I think that's why it's non-magnifying. Okay. Um, although, you know, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but the standard US Army optic is still a non-magnifying. Oh, it, it's shifted around, but... Depends on the requirement. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The ACOGs weren't, yeah. uh, but aim points, which not just the US, but a lot of them. The bog standard, if you're a recruit, you're not being deployed, what you receive on your own 4 is a CCO or some sort of leave yeah. 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 Well, the same over so, here. That's true. Yeah. Now, there was a sniper variant that, that had a telescopic, bulky uh, magnifying sight, 3-ish three, three power. Okay. You know, with a rail yeah. like that, it would have been really well set up for future improvements and changes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we, I've seen photoshops online where people put polymer furniture on it and a rail Maybe not that, but um, it, it's that's the other aspect of the road not travel is what would have happened. Yeah, imagine seeing guys going. Into, you know, would we have still had it in the Falklands? Yes, we would. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> almost certainly. Yeah, so it, it, it's fascinating for that reason. Um, now that, that's you know, skipping ahead somewhat. That is kind of the only good thing about SAATA. <laughs> <laughs> is that they really are trying. They're not just putting optic on there to compensate for it being a ballpark, they're giving you four power, wide field of view. No. Really, that's the biggest advantage. But back then, it's about compensating for iron sights, in, as far as I can tell. Okay. Well, we don't want to give away everything in the book. <laughs> so, this has been very interesting. Thank you for uh, sharing all of this. If you guys think this is an interesting subject and you would like to know all sorts of more, Cool stuff about the whole gamut of British bullpup rifles from the 1860s to 2018, 2019, to the present day, the SA8083s, or uh, LE583s. Uh, check out Jonathan's book. It's currently up on presale on Kickstarter through Headstamp Publishing. Uh, we have a link to it in the description text. There are a bunch of cool different versions, uh, some cool perks that you can get in on uh, by being part of our presale. And uh, Thank you for watching. Thanks for uh, joining us. Very happy to be here.